Happiness. <laughs> Happiness is such a weird one. It's something that I pondered a lot while I was sick with chemotherapy for well over a year. With a very difficult, unforgiving, unfair and terminal disease. But you know, we're, we're all terminal. The goal, I guess, in life is to not die for the greatest amount of time. Or I really like to think more to fit the most into the time that we do have. Because we never know how much time we actually have. But if you're listening to this, then you still have it. Because we all know that we're only ever one step, one doctor's appointment, one accident away from it. It's fucking important to know that we've got time. I think the true beginnings of happiness come, at least myself, when I realised that we're nothing more than a beautifully sequenced stardust aligned by ridiculous, incredible odds hurling through nothingness at a million miles an hour, even if it's just for a short period of time that we're aware of it. To think that we were once the stars, planets, matter, distant galaxies and faraway lands, and that we're part of everything that's around us. We're truly blessed with the ability of consciousness, although the time may seem like a blink of an eye relative to everything else. The very core of what makes us who we are is on an eternal, universal journey forever. No matter can be created or destroyed. It simply just takes a different shape. And although I won't be there to see it or live it or feel it, I think it's awesome that we can spend some time conscious in this journey. I think beauty and importance is found in realising that maybe on the big scheme, we don't actually matter. Where things will happily start, live and die without us, without our influence and in what we cannot change, reach or conquer. But this is where I find where we truly do matter. Because maybe ourselves and each other is all that we have. We have the most complex system that we know sitting between our ears. I've spent many days and nights thinking, staring at the stars, thinking, is this it? Surely there's some overarching meaning, purpose or reason for it all. It was when I stopped searching for it, for something more than myself, is when I found more purpose and less reliance on hope. But what we take for granted is the ability of consciousness of ourselves, others and what's around us. In this universe, we may well be the only ones who can do that. And in turn, that makes us the most important thing in it and the most important thing to each other. This is something rare. If we are the only ones in this grand game who possess this, and for all we know, we are the only ones in this universe, that makes us so important. It doesn't matter if you think there is a grand purpose or that we're nothing more than a statistical anomaly of unfathomable odds. Life's beautiful, exciting, and we all know that it's temporary. So enjoy it. Firstly, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be invited. And although, you know, we can't all meet uh, in Brisbane at the fantastic um, event being held, I'm sure that this online, knowing the people behind this, will be just as brilliant uh, and and just as inspirational from everyone from everyone here. So a massive thank you, and thank you for you know sitting down for half an hour and watching me talk about my story, um, looking through the panel of guests and talkers and everyone involved in this. Um, I sort of feel like you know I'm in the bottom rung of the ladder as it goes. So if you're listening, yeah, you know, thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. Look. After the intro, let's let's wind it back to me at high school. Uh, and I think everyone has a very different memory of high school and everyone has a very different experience. Uh, it's probably the most similar experience I can give to being within an infantry unit. Um, you know, you have such tight groups of people that you're never going to split apart from. That said, at high school, I was a bit of a misfit, a bit of a rogue. Um as you can see, this is me here on the John Deere tractor on the right uh, on muck-up day. And during school, stupidly, and then it's worked out for me, but it could have gone the exact opposite way, I gave myself no other option but to join the military. 
I finished year 12 with terrible scores um, because, you know, halfway through year 12, I got accepted um, to go to Kapuka and go through Singleton. At that time, you know, young and dumb and, you know, ready to go, I had really no idea of, you know, being injured or being, you know, that not being the path I'd go down. So I left myself no other option. And I was incredibly lucky in this that that paid out for me. Otherwise, I seriously do not know what I was doing. But I think that misfit, rogue sort of mindset, you know, no, never to hurt anyone, but just, you know, I love to laugh and I do anything for it and, you know, make people happy. I think that came into my career as well. And this is me as an early digger with uh, my best mate, Jacob Williams, who I'm about to be his best man at his wedding, um, at least once some restrictions lift. I'm sure a lot of you are in the same boat. But I think this photo sums up my early years as a digger. And I think, I think it sums up really well diggers in general, you know, that we don't take anything too seriously. And I think that is part of the spirit of the Australian digger throughout history. Um, the story behind this, we bought this tandem bike. We all got pulled in the whole platoon. The platoon sergeant basically said, Woody at the time went, boys, look, if you live on the barracks, stop bloody driving to work because all of us who live off, we can't get a car park in the morning. Like just go on Gumtree and buy a bike. So we did. Me and Willie went and bought this that we found. And for the next couple of months at work, every day, we were the dudes in our yellow Alpha Company t-shirts cruising into 7RAR on a bloody tandem. The RSM hated it. The CO loved it. So there was a bit there and then, you know, it became, you know, it's two Ks to the front gate of work. So every Friday, Saturday night or whatever night we're going out in the piss, it was righto on the tandem down to the front gate, stashed in a bush and then on the way, um, on the way home. And then I think a lot changed then with me then deploying to Afghanistan. Meaning a lot changed as taking the job a lot more seriously and the job was on um no matter how realistic people make exercises whatever it's not like going to the middle east and you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of people who are on tours like mine and you know, the fpe tours who i guess the itch wasn't scratched they were not combat tours we were not out you know seeking and killing the enemy we were force element protection you know that that's what we did um, and I think I sum that up of, yeah, I, as an infantryman, that's what we want to do. We want to go out and seek and close at the enemy and kill them. That's what we want to do. That's what the infantry is there for. But at the time, the job was this. And I say to a lot of my friends who have struggled with that, that, no, but we did the job. We did the job that was given to us off the government. Um, and so I was every other Aussie soldier through time. And we did a bloody good job of it. As you can see... This is the first time I ever saw snow. You know, they say the army opens you to new experiences. Well, I'd never seen snow before <laughs> before going uh, to Afghanistan. And then for those of you who have deployed and, you know, some who are in contact with people who are, you know, deployed or have deployed, you'll be aware that you get uh, over a six-month tour, I believe, you get a, a relief out of country. Um, rock all, rock far, you know, the amount of acronyms that the army gives on... I know like half of them, if that. Um, so me and Griffo went to Greece and we were on a fairly long tour uh, and not as long as we thought, uh, sorry, it ended up longer than we thought due to um, a little bit of changeover between Iraq and Afghan at the same time we got extended. Anyway, it was meant to be a seven and a half month tour. Me and Griffo, me being a crew commander in Afghanistan at the time, we went on the very first rockle. So we were only in Afghanistan for like four or five weeks. And then we got like a two week relief out of country, but coming back to like, you know, six and a half, seven months in country and being like, oh my God, we need to make the most of this. So as you see, we did, we went to Greece and as you can see, we've had an absolute shocking time um, as young 21 maybe 22 year olds um in the greek islands on kentucky it was just it was just a terrible time and you know we didn't want to you know we all we could think about was going back to afghanistan <laughs> that was that was that was all we wanted to do i think afghanistan was a big big turning point in my life i think i did mature so much over that time 
uh, I was deployed there as a crew commander of, you know, a Bushmaster PMV, which was not my job. You know, I am an infantryman. Uh, that's what I did. But my tour FPE 7, there was a slight change in how the FPE infantry and the PMV, uh, like, drivers or the, the crew of the vehicles was going to be working. Um now, basically, they'd had a lot of rift between the FPE grunts and the truckies. And not only that, but a lot of um, skill not being shared across, I guess, tactical mindset of some of the some of the truckies. Not to any fault of their own, but you know, they're a truckie, they're not a grunt. Um, so in my tour, we sprinkled in some grunts, um, sprinkled in the beauty, um, to put us in there to see how we went. Now, I ended up uh, being a, a infantry you know, infantryman, crew commander. I was the only crewy who was a grunt and who was a digger, you know, a private soldier. So I did run into some problems with some of the rank in the transport, but that, you know, that all ended up with, you know, me telling them to F off and that, that was, you know, um, that was about it. With this vehicle, you know, I chucked my name on it. The boss came down, the OC, um, Mr. Tyson at the time, and gave, you know, we had, say, 12 vehicles and gave us 11 names. And I was like, you know, well, these names he gave us were ones, you know, of battle 7 RAR, 7RAR had been involved in. So I took it upon myself to make the 12th name that wasn't given to us. And um, as you can see on the side there, that was um, that was definitely the right choice. Kabul. You know, there's probably something you see in the news a lot now. This is me looking over Kabul. Um, we were just rocking around with the, um, the UK Brits at the time. And then we left. Um, I got extended, say, two and a half weeks or something like that. Um, our trip got extended anyway, and then when the 3rd Battalion came in, um, I can't remember the exact incident, whether it was weather uh, or some, like, V-bid or something in the city, but basically all the routes went black. We couldn't drive around, fly around, whatever. So our guys left, three came in, but we couldn't do a correct handover. So I got extended a couple of weeks to hand over to Thraera, which was a great time. They needed me for like two trips through the city to just be like, turn here, turn there. That roundabout doesn't exist on the map. And they were then good to go. You know, the amount of training those guys did before coming, you know, they were, they slotted straight in. I came back and then went straight on to a promotional course. My post-deployment warlike leave uh, got, wavered to be early, to be cut short early um, to go on sub two size, which I'm sure most people are involved uh, know the, the course. You know, it's a corporal promotional course um, and one of the harder courses um, within, you know, at least the infantry. Um, and, you know, my career was doing this. It was going where I really wanted it to go. And then, you know, I, I came home off that course. I finally took some leave over Christmas and, basically on a big night out on a on christmas eve which is you know well i i've had a bit of a running argument with my girlfriend over this but i believe christmas eve is the biggest night of the year to go out she doesn't think anyone goes out on it but in 2017 went out christmas eve and somehow in the pub i managed to be talking to a friend who lived in finland who was an exchange student i knew back when i was in year 10 or 11 at school you know this is five or six years ago and I thought nothing of it. The next day, I woke up Christmas Day, unwrap my bloody stocking, whatever. Next thing, I get a text off like an airline, like, hey, you can check in now. I'm like, check in for what? And I live in Adelaide, and I had a check in for a flight in Tullamarine to fly to Finland on Boxing Day, the next day. So getting to Tullamarine <laughs> Christmas Day to fly out Boxing Day morning, a little bit, little bit interesting. Um, but I think this is just the, the confidence and the, the life sort of um, trajectory I was on at the time. Things were just going right. You know, it was like, this is no problem. I can just do this, you know. What's what's the worst can happen? Here we go. Woohoo. And, you know, I travelled uh, for, I think, maybe 40 days um, through at least 17 countries. Um, and, you know, this photo is with Mary uh, and one of her friends whose name absolutely just comes out of my mind at the moment, but we travelled Finland and Sweden um, together um, and it was an awesome time. And then, you know, as you can see again, seeing all the sights, you know, taking it all in. And one of my big claims to fame is that I've done a shoey 
in every single country that I've visited, whether it be Finland or Sweden or Switzerland, well, this one particularly um, is in Switzerland on like, the first, the first morning beer of the day as well. to Afghanistan. I'm sure he's there as well. And I hope to clock up a couple more once, you know, once the borders open. Came back, you know, and as you know, a lot of people come off deployment with, you know, a lot of good money. Um, you know, good money for someone who's 21 years old. Bloody brilliant. Um, so me and the guys, half the boys went and bought super sport motorbikes, like your thousand cc CBRs, you know, whatever's. Uh, and then other half, we all went and got our skydiving license. Little would you think that, you know, we all were fine skydiving and, you know, within a couple of weeks we lost a few guys uh, from dying in motorcycle accidents uh, on, you know, your super sport motorbikes, which, you know, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir here to people who are in the medical world that the, the danger of those bikes um, is just incredible. And then... Look, as I talk, my life was doing this, and you, know, you wouldn't think anything could go wrong. You know, I was invincible. I'd done Afghanistan, I'm jumping out of planes, traveling the world, earning good money as a young man. And one morning, you know, I woke up with a headache, and it was sort of ongoing. I just put up with it for a week. And it came to that Friday, and I struggled with a headache all week. Came to Friday and hit up my section commander at the time, just like, hey, hearts, mate, I. I can't do the pack march this morning. Like, I, I just, my head is so bad, I can't do it. And he was like, fuck, it's not really that common that Willie wouldn't do the pack march. Like, it's something he would just do. And he's like, he hung over. I'm like, no, nah, mate, I'm not not at all. I'm, like, it's just the headache I've got. And he went, look, I had a mate die of a brain aneurysm at your bloody age. You are going to the med center to get checked out or I'm going to bloody charge you or I'll drag you there. Anyway, dragged me down there. You know, I thought it was just a waste of time. And I thought, ah, the only reason I'll really go is it was the same week in early 2018, maybe around February, that codeine uh, became a prescription drug. And I was like, well, if I get drug tests and taking codeine, you know, to, to Trump somehow help these bloody headaches, I'll get kicked out of the defense and lose my job. And, you know, this is a career job for me. I want to be here for the rest of my time. Um, you know, I want to be the bloody RSM of a unit <laughs> and I want to do selection and that's blah, 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 everything. Um, so I went down there trying to get some codeine and the doctor basically said, look, mate, there's nothing wrong with you that we can see. So look, because you're in the defense force, it's easy for us to send you for a CT scan. Uh, went, got a CT and thought nothing of it. But as I was driving home, I knew something was wrong when the the imaging specialist at the CT rang me and said, hey, like, Mr. Williams, I can't get in touch with your doctor, Dr. Kuziak, uh, and I don't have you know any permissions to tell you anything, but you need to go into your medical centre as soon as you're back at work. And I come back into work, basically walk in the med centre and ush it in and then given a, um, a referral to go get an MRI and I'm back out the door to get an MRI. Bloody no idea what was going on. And by that afternoon, you know, this all happened in a day. By that afternoon, uh, I was given a, a referral, an emergency referral to see a neurosurgeon the next week. And I had no idea what was going on. And I, I thought brain tumors, cancers, whatever, were just something that happened in movies. Um, and not only that, I was like, well, there's no way that's happening to me at this age and how I feel. Uh, and if that is that, then you're dead. Like, you know, you're seeing like, like in the movie Saw, the guy has a brain tumor and it's like he's all but written off dead. And that's what it was. I had a, a lower grade tumor on my front left lobe of my brain. And I think it was a shock to everyone. Um, this photo that you see, this is at Willie's death party. Um, so I was diagnosed officially on the 10th of March. And the 10th of March somehow just works out that it is also my birthday. And it was my 22nd. Um, it was the only birthday I'd had in Australia, oh, sorry, I should say at home, you know, and be able to have a beer, um, since joining defense, you know, my 19th, I was outfield at Singleton, 20th, I was on a DFSW, uh, like Overwatch for course, my 21st, I was in Afghanistan and the 22nd, well, diagnosed with a brain tumor. <laughs> so yeah, you can see how that's going for me. Um, luckily my well, the 23rd, I was still on chemo, so maybe it hasn't got much better since. Um, 
But I think this sums up the true Aussie spirit of the diggers. The boys ran a surprise party for me. Literally four hours after being diagnosed. They'd already had a, a birthday planned for me, but because I'd been diagnosed, the boys named it Willie's Death Party. <laughs> and not even to agree, but in my opinion, being able to laugh at yourself, laugh at something is purely the best way to accept and get over something. And this is why, you know, dark humor to me matters so much. And I think it's something that, you know, has helped me a lot. And this was just like one of those, yeah, mate, Willie, bad news, mate. We know you're carking it, but you're still here. Let's have a beer. Fucking Willie's death party. Let's go. You know, it, it, it I think this helped me more than ever to get to get through what I was going through, but it wasn't easy. You know, I had months of being down and going through shit and I didn't really know what to do. You know, I had a surgery on my head that a small incision across, but the bloody, you know, the, the staples or the stitches they give you in your head are like the most painful thing in the world. Um, and I think I really started getting back on the horse about Anzac Day. You know, this photo of Anzac Day, me with my medals on, it's the first time I'd ever worn my medals since, you know, the Middle East. Um, and as you can see there, that is my first round of chemotherapy. I did the march, um, through the city, um, and right at the end, yeah, I, mum and dad met mum and dad there and it was probably my first round or second round, maybe second day in, you know, five day intervals every month, um, taking chemo at the end of the march. And for me, I think this summed up that it's like, yeah, look, this is happening to me. But what the uniform stands for, what the medals are, and you're being there for the fallen soldiers is so much bigger than me. So I can put up with, you know, feeling a bit crap to do this. Uh, that said, my health through chemo plummeted. It wasn't until I saw a psychologist that I really resonated with that helped me massively. Um, I'd seen a few psychs and I just didn't really get anything. It was just, I just felt like I was having a bloody whinge. Um, and I finally got a referral from my oncologist uh, a couple of months into chemo to see a psych who deals purely in, I guess, uh, trauma and loss. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with me really at the time. But you know, it, you know, it's pretty bad when you know, your mates are like, "Will you really need to bloody see someone?" Um, and then I was finally really accepted and went and saw him. And Dr. Harvey Andrew, um, who you know, I can't give more credit to really, I think opened up how my mindset worked. And it was, and I was talking to him, he's like, Willie, you're not a bucket list person. I think he's like the advice you seem to have got from people is to create a bucket list and do these things you want to do. You're not that way driven because you have just done stuff. If you wanted to get your skydiving license, you just did it. You wanted to go and travel Europe, you just booked a ticket and went. He said, you have no problem doing bucket list items because you'll just, you'll just do it um, rather than it you know, being something you strive to go and to build up the confidence to do. You need a purpose. And he said, you'll lose, you've lost that purpose of defense because at the time, you know, I, was, I was like, whoever knows the mech status, I was like, Jay, a million. I couldn't do anything. Um, you know, it's, it's probably the best shit anyone's ever bloody seen, but, and, but that purpose was gone and, and, and there wasn't anything there. Um, and he really said, you need to refine a purpose. And I think that's when the charity stuff started, you know, the tire flipping, I'm sure most people here have seen the tire flips. Um, it's a two kilometer tire flip. And basically my, in the, what I wanted to do was raise a thousand dollars. That was it. A thousand bucks, um, between my platoon and my platoon go to the beach on a Friday morning, flip a tyre from the Largs Bay jetty to Semaphore jetty. Anyone who's you know in touch with Adelaide, um, you don't feel bad if you're not. It's Adelaide, um, and it was one thousand bucks. But two, it was like, well, I'll get the boys out of work for half the day. You know, we'll go do that and we'll have some brekkie. And you know, well, he's the best man in the bloody platoon. Um, but the video I put it, I think, just resonated with people. And you know, in that first tyre flip, we had hundreds of people. Um, and that first year we had, um, 24, 25, I believe, tie flips around the world. We had one in Afghanistan, one in Iraq, some in the States, one in France, one in Italy, and then all around Australia at basically every infantry unit and multiple other units. 
um, and we raised, I believe, somewhere in the ballpark of sixty thousand ish dollars, um, with some money still just going direct. So it was a bit more than that, uh, and that was raised, you know, purely not even not even just um, profit. It was ex- expenses included. Everything went to that. I thought the best donation I can do is I will pay to run all these events. I'll, I'll pay. That's my donation is running this stuff. So every cent you donate. 100% of it is going to the charity. You know, you don't donate $100 and 90 of it go to, you know, paying for me to rent a bar. No, 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 it doesn't. It's not like that. It, it's like all of it. And I think, you know, I'm not, it, at the end of the day, this is like the most selfish thing I've ever done. Um, you know, on, on one hand, you know, I raised a shitload of money for brain cancer research charity, but the amount of like mental, um, like, help I got out of doing this, of refining a purpose and, you know, doing something that outlives myself, that lives on longer than me. It's the best thing I've ever done for myself as well. And I took so much out of it. Um, and seeing everyone there, it was like, you know, a big family of defense. People talk about family defense, family defense. And I know a lot of people take the piss um, because, you know, it doesn't seem like it on a day-to-day basis. Um, you know, it might just be some snake yelling at you. But I think when everything went wrong for me, that's when everyone, it really felt like it was there. Um, and that was six months through chemo. I ran the first one of that. And so far we've done, you know, we had those all on the same day all around the country. And then we've run one the next year. And so we've raised somewhere, well, I've raised somewhere between, you know, it's about 200000 ish dollars. I'm not really sure, but directly into Australia, brain cancer research. And then after that first event, back into chemo. So I did 12 rounds of chemo over a 13-month period. And it got rough after that event, you know, it just went really downhill for me. I spent weeks in hospital, weeks on steroid drugs, everything. Um, and I was just not the man I was, uh, before it took away what made me, me, you know, I sat on the couch just still because any, any function was just gone, um, and it, it's a terrible drug. But you know, finishing, finishing chemo with my mum, one of the proudest moments of my life, probably the biggest thing I've ever, ever pushed through. Um, and how am I going now? Well, the chemo sort of didn't work. It shrunk the the tumor, which is you know forty two millimeters, about three or four mil. That that's all it did. Um, but three or four mil in the brain is a lot, and I guess my diagnosis and prognosis now is I have a scan on my head every three months to make to just try and monitor what's happening because of you know there's a there's hundreds of different types of like drugs an oncologist can give you and mixes and all this crap but for brain tumors there's only one that can actually cross the blood brain barrier and sadly I've become immune to that drug so the only options I really have left are surgery and then uh, radiotherapy and um, you know, I'll have surgery, then radio first, but where my tumor sits on my left motor strip it doesn't really work for me having a surgery. Um, this tumor will regrow and it's part of who I am. It's a genetic based tumor. So it'll regrow. And the decision I'm faced with at the moment is, you know, just living life as we go and see how long I can push it like a, like a ship going with a hole in the side of it, just see how far we can go before we sink or try and have a very risky surgery that will remove the movement on right side of my body for anywhere from loss of hand movement through to I'm paralyzed to my complete right side, but it'll give me a few more years. So that's the toss up a few more years, but with a deficit or we just see how far I can go until this gets me. And at the moment I'm choosing option B. I'm just pushing to see, you know, how long I can survive with this. And as I'm talking to you, um, I have a, I had an MRI yesterday morning and I've got the results next week. Um, so I'll see if I can update with how that has gone. But I think the biggest thing I've found through all of this is finding a purpose, having a drive. They are the most important things that keep you going mentally and looking after those around you and looking after yourself. Look, guys, it's a quick one. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute honor and I hope to meet everyone uh, when you know we can have something go ahead like this in person in the coming years. Thank you very much, um, Matt Williams. And cheers. If you want to follow my journey, it's Willie really Beating Cancer on basically all socials. So thank you very much. Look after yourself and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you.
Cheers.